Hey, yo, Moguls, what's up? This is Reggie Yosei, host of Mogul. And I want to put you up on a new podcast that I really, really, really mess with, man. It's called Uncivil. It's hosted by Jack Hitt and Chinjirai Kumayika, and it breaks down the Civil War. Like, now, you know the Civil War and relics of the Civil War and the, the Confederate flag and statues. You know, that's been a big topic in, in, in current news. And, you know, you have a faction of people that say that history doesn't matter, like we're in this new time, forget it, forget the past. And you got people that say, like, it does matter. Well, these guys do a great job of, like, just unpacking, dissecting and going deep into the Civil War and showing you why what happened in the past has so much relevancy to what happens today. Listen to Uncivil. I give it five thumbs up. Stories about Civil War monuments have been in the news all summer. But the monument that bothers us the most doesn't feature Robert E. Lee or the Confederate flag. In fact, it features Abraham Lincoln. That's about, how high is that, maybe 20 feet? Yeah, probably about 20 feet. Lincoln is kind of looking down on us, his hand is extended. Got this black man on his knees in front of Lincoln, maybe trying to stand up or rise. Still got a shackle around his arm. It looks like maybe the, the, the enslaved person might be shining Lincoln's shoes or something. The statue is called the Freedmen's Memorial. It's in Washington, D.C., put up in 1876. It's so much in this statue. I mean, the, the man, the, the freed man who may be rising, he's got a broken chain on his arm, but he's dressed like a, he's only got like a, a loincloth. He, otherwise, he is, he is absolutely naked. Meanwhile, Abraham Lincoln is in a full 19th century dress coat, pants, boots, Lincoln is still standing over the dude. And in a way, this doesn't really give any credit or represent the agency of black people in freeing themselves. Black people were trying to free themselves, rebel from slavery before the Civil War even started. I hate this statue. (laughs) (laughs) I hate it too. I'm Jack Hitt. And I'm Chinjirai Kumanyika. This is Uncivil where we ransack America's history and discover that the past is never really past. You will not replace us! You will not replace us! This fall, we're going to bring you stories of espionage. In that day and time, you had to be a spy. There had to be a lot of spy in you to be Black and to survive. Betrayal. I feel like someone has put a dagger through my heart. Con artists. He produced $15 million worth of fake money. And black people fighting back. They helped free themselves, you know? The girl was bad, you know? Do you think the Civil War is still relevant now? American society was built out of the Civil War. The story of slavery, the story of the Civil War, the story of the statue is the story of America. We're going to kick things off with a story that was written out of the official history just weeks after it happened. It's about the most ambitious covert operation of the Civil War. And it's about black people who never thought they'd pick up a gun, but they did. One of those people was named Shedrick Manigo. To his family, he was Pa Shed. He was a short man. He was a dark-skinned man. He had like a little bit, I guess he had like a little bit of a beard. This is Fallon Green, Pa Shed's great-great-granddaughter. She's a paralegal in Beaufort, South Carolina, just a couple of miles from where our story takes place. Growing up, she'd heard a little about Pashad. She knew that he'd built the church her family went to. But as she got older, she began digging deeper into her family history and started asking about him. And it turned out one of her living relatives, Uncle Baby, actually knew Pashad. So I was told that I should go to my Uncle Baby and try to find out a little bit more um, of the details. You said that Uncle Baby knew Pashed. Is he the first person to tell you about your great-great-grandfather? He's the first person to tell me the truth. And um, the light was a little, you know, it's not lit very well. And so it's a little, it was a little, I wouldn't say magical. But anyway, the light kind of cascaded on him and he sat and he he didn't look me in the eye. He kind of like started to think back. He said, let me get it right. And he starts to tell me um, about the story. And it was just lightning. The story Uncle Baby told Fallon was that right at the beginning of the Civil War, 
pot shed was sold to a plantation in South Carolina called Hazel Farm. And when he gets to Hazel Farm, okay, he hates his overseer or whoever it is that's there. So he decides to run away. And he had an idea about how to do it. You got to remember, Poshed was deep in the Confederate-controlled South. Maps now show the South is red, the North is blue, but there were patches of blue in the South. One of them was a union control fort on an island in Port Royal Sound. And it happened to be not far from where Poshed was enslaved. So, on the fly, he came up with a plan to get over to the fort. And what they do is they fashion a pine log. Basically, they cut down a tree to make a raft. And then they put it by the banks of the Beaufort River. They cover it with brush. They come back at the darker night and they, of course, uncover the pine log. Push it into the river and hop on. And the visual that I'm given with the story is that they straddle that pine log. And they floated, as it was said to me, floated to mainland Beaufort. That morning, Pa Shed and his brother made it to freedom. As it turned out, just a few weeks before they got there, new military leaders had arrived at Port Royal. And among them was a radical abolitionist, Colonel James Montgomery. To really get a sense of this guy, you need to see a daguerreotype picture of him. He has that thousand-mile stare of an underfed lunatic and bed hair that looks like he cut it himself with broken glass. Montgomery wasn't trained at West Point. He learned guerrilla warfare, fighting against pro-slavery settlers in Kansas. One time, after his farm was attacked, he tracked them in back to where they lived and burned down the entire town. In Kansas, people like Montgomery were called Jayhawkers. Nowadays, they'd call him a terrorist. I'm Brody James Montgomery. I am the third great-grandson of Colonel James Montgomery. I am the owner and founder of Brody's Spirits. We make moonshine. (laughs) Brody has proved that genetics is not always destiny. The colonel wasn't your standard frontier wild man. He was fiercely religious, and to his great-grandson's dismay, he was also a prohibitionist. He wasn't known to drink. Who doesn't drink? (laughs) Montgomery came to Port Royal ready to fight, and he wanted to recruit freed black people like Pa Shedd to fill out his regiment. But military leaders up north weren't into it. In fact, they specifically forbid arming black men. Montgomery and his commanders did it anyway. And I can see him just going outside and going, all right, everybody, come on over, grab some guns, let's go kill some people. These guys need to die. It's hard to know exactly how Montgomery's new black recruits felt about all this. Poshet had just risked his life to gain his freedom. But then he found out he only had one, to enlist in the United States Army. I don't think he was like, oh yeah, let me fight. Like, I'm so excited. Maybe in that kind of fervor of other men saying, you know, I'm taking up arms and I'm gonna fight for my freedom. You get this feeling of, wow, this is big. One summer morning, Montgomery and the other officers lined up their new recruits. And then they asked what your size is, what shoe size you have. You don't have shoes, you've never worn shoes. And they give you a uniform. They tell you you have to keep it clean. You put on the trousers. You've never really had trousers that went all the way down. But now you do. You know, you've, you've got to polish buttons that are your own buttons, not some other person's buttons. You know, you've got to learn how to march. You know, you've got a hat. You've got a gun. Let's be clear about something. The history of slavery, 250 years of it, is a history of keeping guns out of the hands of Black people. Even being found near a gun could get you hanged. Now, men like Pa Shed were going to pick up guns and use them. It was just an ordinary thing he did, but just stumbled into this great moment in history and happened to be standing next to Colonel James Montgomery. Montgomery called this new unit the 2nd Regiment South Carolina Volunteer Infantry, African descent. And even though lots of slaves were escaping to Port Royal, Montgomery still needed more soldiers. So he and his commanders decided, why wait for men like Pa Shedd to come to them? Why not go straight to the plantations? But he needed a plan. He needed good intel and a strategy. What he really needed was a spy. And the perfect person was already at Port Royal. There's a youthful quality to her. I I find her to be 
really handsome. And some people don't necessarily think that's the best description of any woman, but I mean, I think she had incredible bone structure. She was shorter than I am. I'm 5'2", she was like five, five feet. She's just, you know, a little tiny thing. But she did this massive job, right? That's Kimberly Cornish, a descendant of the spy. And here's another descendant. I think that in that day and time, you had to be a spy. There had to be a lot of spy in you to be Black and to survive. She grew up on a slave plantation, so she knew what it was like to maybe walk by a master and hear information, then tell another slave that information. She had a lot of experience being a spy and being under a lot of pressure by the time she met Montgomery. My name is Jade Lee, and I'm the great-great-great-grandniece of Harriet Tubman. Yeah, that Harriet Tubman, the conductor of the Underground Railroad. The government assigned her to Port Royal to work as a nurse and teacher, but she quickly took on a new role as well. Escaping slaves were debriefed by Harriet Tubman, so they would have had some intelligence, and, and that's where Harriet Tubman kind of shines. That's Jeff Gregg. He runs a boat motor repair shop near Port Royal and spends many of his weekends researching this expedition. He wrote a book about it. It's the only book exclusively dedicated to Montgomery and Tubman's plan. What they came up with was audacious, bordering on reckless. They would take boats up a nearby river, deep into heavily fortified Confederate territory, and raid eight separate plantations. They would recruit all the black people enslaved along the shore, and somehow, make it out alive. How would they pull it off? Harriet Tubman could help. The banks of these rivers were usually lined with cannons, but the Confederates had pulled them from several of these rivers. One of them was the Cumbie. Only a few riflemen remained. And while the river was filled with explosive mines, the men who laid them had escaped and told Tubman exactly where they were. She is not so much the the scout or the spy. She's the one who took the information, gathered it, put it together, disseminated it to the proper people, which made this raid possible. I think that's what the CIA would call a spy master, right? I liken it to is that she was not the James Bond, she was M. Who is more important? A James Bond, although a good figure for the movie, was expendable. M was not expendable. On June 1, 1863, some 300 mostly black soldiers, including Pa Shedd, got on three gunboats led by Tubman and Montgomery and steamed off into the harbor. Eventually, we'll get to the mouth of the Cumbie River and start going up the Cumbie River where the raid really started. After the break, the 2nd South Carolina Regiment goes deep into Confederate territory. Jeff Grigg took us out on the water so we could see what Pa Shed would have seen as the boats approached the Cumbie. The, the, the landscape kind of looks like a, an African savanna, except we're broken up by the, the dark waters of the St. Helena Sound. This area is filled with dolphin, uh, turtles. Um, even in summertime, we get manatees come up into this area. The gunboats had set off under the cover of night. Three ships left uh, Buford approximately 9 p.m. on the uh, 1st of of June. Once the soldiers entered the mouth of the river, they sat in silence all night. I could just see Pa Shed there in that boat, wondering, what's going to happen when he gets upriver to the plantations? He'd been enslaved there, and now he was going back. And if he got caught, he knew he'd be shot or tortured and sent back to slavery. The trip upriver took all night. It was dawn when the boats pulled up to the first plantation. People were already working in the fields. The soldiers jumped off the boats and began marching up the levee. It didn't take long for the enslaved families to figure out what was happening and to start running to the landings. And then Montgomery gave his regiment another order. Burn it all down. When they went on these raids, they would 
literally burn everything with the exception of the slave streets, because if there's any that did not come, they wanted them to still have housings. But the main houses, the barns, the rice mills, all that would have been burned. Anything to economically hurt the uh, the plantation owners. So if I'm, you know, part of like one of the second volunteers under Montgomery, I'm still going to a place that was like hell for me. I mean, what would I have been thinking at that moment? You know, I, I would think that if, if you had come from one of these plantations, you'd be glad to be going back to liberating your people. When they got to uh, the Hayward and to the Lowndes plantations, that's across a mile wide marsh that was nothing but open rice fields. There's no trees, there's no cover, absolutely open ground. They were ill-trained. They had only been in existence for a few months and not the first man turned around, nobody shirked. And I think it's one of the uh, greatest examples of bravery by any troops any time in the war. Now, imagine you're one of the plantation owners. You get up at five o'clock in the morning like you always do, walk over to the window, and what do you see? Hundreds of uniformed black soldiers heading straight towards you. We actually found a letter from one of these plantation owners. His name was Joshua Nichols, and he wrote to the local paper describing what happened. When he sees the soldiers, he panics and calls together all his faithful slaves. He actually used the word faithful. <laughs> yeah, let me read this part. My house servants stood all around me, professing the utmost detachment and their perfect willingness to obey my commands. I ordered them to follow me and take to the woods. They all professed a willingness to do so, but not one made a sign of moving. So I was forced to fly to the woods for protection. <laughs> so picture that scene. Nichols turns to his slaves and says, the union is coming. Let's go. And they're like, yeah, you first. It's like when those gumbos showed up, the power dynamic switched up so fast, Nichols can't catch up. He really thinks his slaves are going to follow his ass. These folks are looking at those same black soldiers and what they see is freedom. <laughs> and then Nichols sees something else. Here's what he says in the letter. I saw the enemy come up to my house and in a very short time, it was set on fire. Yeah. Now Nichols was really panicked. So here's how he puts it. The Negroes, men and women, were rushing to the boat with their children, now and then greeting someone whom they recognized. They were utterly transformed, drunk with excitement and capable of the wildest excesses. The roaring of the flames, the barbarous howls, the blowing of horns, the harsh steam whistle, and the towering columns of smoke made an impression on my mind which can never be effaced. Up and down the river, plantations burned. Hundreds of now free people climbed onto the soldiers' boats. My posh Ed would have been on that boat, looking out, you know, at the women coming. I see him there. When they got to the banks of that plantation, I mean, what, what do you think they saw? Um, the world being right again. I think they saw their families. I think they knew each other and maybe had someone to rescue, you know, over there. You know, they maybe may have been liberating their kids. When I look at who I would be if I was in that time, I think, wow, you know, I think it's beautiful. I think it is something I never would have dreamed of. You know how, like, you need something so much and it just never happens and you just forget it and you, you don't ever, you know, think about it because it's just a terrible thing to think about because it hurts. And then one day that one thing happens that you need and you're just overwhelmed. The boats headed back down the Cumbie River. At the last bend, enraged Confederates appeared with cannons, but Montgomery's troops fired first and slipped past with just enough time to chug out of range. On board were more than 700 newly freed people. Just to put that in context, if you look at Tubman's work on the Underground Railroad, most conservative estimates say that she helped free roughly 75 people over the course of 10 years. But in the Cumby raid, more than 700 in a single trip. After they got to Port Royal, nearly all the freed men of fighting age immediately enlisted. And by the end of the war, 10% of the U.S. Army was African American. The success of the Cumby raid was front page news in 1863, north and south. Heading up a river, daringly making a strike behind enemy lines, a month later, Robert E. Lee tried the exact same tactic at Gettysburg, a daring dash behind enemy lines. 
and we all know how that worked out. Major movies have been made about Lee's greatest disaster, but there's never been a movie about the success of the Cumbie Raid. In fact, I only heard of it because it was the name of a feminist collective in the 1960s who took their name from Harriet Tubman's leadership in the raid. It's not in any standard history textbooks. The only official recognition is a tiny bridge down where the highway crosses the Cumbie. It's named after Harriet Tubman, but it took two years of political wrangling to get a small sign placed at the river. So, Chinge, if you did make a big Gettysburg-like movie out of this, I mean, why haven't they made a movie out of this? Well, it's probably because... It wouldn't have like that typical Civil War ending, you know, the kind where everybody just dies in glory at the end, you know, especially the black heroes. So how would it end then? Well, you know, you'd have to talk about Harriet Tubman. So she buys a piece of land up in Auburn and then basically spends all kinds of time and energy trying to fight for her pension. Then you'd have to talk about crazy ass Montgomery. You know, (laughs) he, he basically moves back to Kansas and just continues being a terrorist for good or something, you know. Yeah, but then you'd have to talk about Bachet. I mean, what's his legacy? Well, number one, he lives. You know, he has a family. He becomes like this local leader. So what would be the last scene in in your movie? For me, the last scene, we're in Beaufort, right? And you just see this log and the axe comes down on the log like, bam, you know. And But this time, Pasha isn't making a raft to escape slavery. He's splitting the log to build his church, mm-hmm. you know? And so then you see him take the pine logs, and then maybe you have one of those sequences where we see them build the church. And then the camera pulls back. Right. There's the church. It's like a beautiful southern day, blue sky clouds in the harbor, mm-hmm. Spanish moss on the trees, and you see the crowd beginning to file in for the church service. And then you realize from the clothes they're wearing, this is 2017. Wow. It's Pashed's church, and this is his family. And then you hear the final voiceover. My ancestor, Pashed, was the, the man who um, basically built the community where we live in now. Like he, in 1892, he donated the four acres that we have now, four acres to build the church. It was his son, him and his sons, who like split the pine logs to build Second Gethsemane Church today, Baptist Church. And it stands today, and people still worship and go. My mom still goes. Civil is produced by Chris Neary, Chiquita Pascal, and Saeed Tijan Thomas. We had more help from Stevie Lane and Alvin Malaith. Our senior producer is Kimmy Regler. Editing by Pat Walters, Jorge Just, Caitlin Kenny, and Alex Bloomberg. Our show is mixed by Bobby Lord. The music for Uncivil was composed by Bobby Lord and Matthew Bowl in collaboration with Ann Caldwell and the Magnolia Singers, as well as Mount Zion AME Church on Glebe Street in Charleston, South Carolina. We'd like to thank everyone in the Low Country for a fantastic week of recording. Additional music features J.C. Brooks, Sun Little, Rocco Walker, Haley Shaw, and Saeed T. John Thomas. Fact checking by Michelle Harris. Our secret weapon is Christopher Peak. Special thanks to Captain Meg of Botany Bay Eco Tours in South Carolina, the Penn Center staff, Eric Bailey, Joan and John. Uncivil is a production of Gimlet Media. Our website is uncivil.show. We're on Twitter and Facebook at Uncivil Show. I'm Jack Hitt. I'm Chinjirai Kumanika. On next week's episode of Uncivil, a 19th century promise and a 21st century betrayal. I feel like someone has put a dagger through my heart. My siblings and I have been robbed. We'll see you next week. Internets, if you really mess with this, open up your podcast app, rate, subscribe, and comment, and make Uncivil the hit that it should be.